Hola a todos, me llamo David Valdés. Quiero dar la bienvenida a los percusionistas, colegas, amigos y músicos que están viendo este vídeo. Bienvenidos a Oviedo, la capital de Asturias. Ahora mismo me encuentro delante del Auditorio Príncipe Felipe, sede de la Orquesta Sinfónica del Principado de Asturias. Asturias es un pequeño príncipe located en la northern coast of Spain, which is in southwestern Europe. It is the region where I was born in and where I work as a percussionist. You already know some works named after Asturias, like this one by Isaac Albéniz, or this one by Manuel de Falla. This is the cathedral in Oviedo where music has been made since at least the 15th century. Its library treasures a very important amount of musical works ranging from Gregorian chant, choral and orchestral works, violin concerti, polyphony, Here, the mutual influence between popular and serious music has been a constant, and this is what my presentation is all about. The influence of Asturian music, the music from Asturias, in a master work we all know very well because it's very interesting percussion parts. Capricho Español by Rimsky-Korsakov. Capricho Español was written by Rimsky-Korsakov in 1887. But did he write it? Well, not quite. This is Ecos de España, Echoes of Spain, a compilation of Spanish popular songs and dances, which you can get for free from the website of the Spanish National Library. It was compiled by José Incenga Castellanos, a composer and musicologist quite popular in the 19th century. Ecos de España was published in 1873, which is 14 years before Capricho was written. This book, Ecos de España, is the Rosetta Stone that allows us to understand the composing process of Capricho. Ecos de España is divided into several chapters, each one devoted to a specific Spanish region. So, we have music from Catalonia, Asturias, Andalucía, Castilla, Galicia, Valencia. Let's have a look at the chapter featuring the music from Asturias. Do any of these titles sound familiar to you? Of course they do! We have the Alborada, we have the Fandango Asturiano, and we too have the Danza Prima, which we will see is the second movement. The Variazioni. Let's also have a look at the chapter devoted to the music of Andalucía, where you can see here the Canto Gitano. At that time, José Incenga Castellanos was quite criticized because he harmonized and wrote accompaniments to very simple and plain songs that were sung a cappella. Little did those critics suspect that those harmonizations would be used by Rimsky Korsakov. Let's check the Alborada in José Incenga Castellanos compilation, which predates Capricho Español by 14 years. We can see that Rimsky Korsakov used the same melody, the same accompaniment, and the same harmonies. It is quite clear that Korsakov got his inspiration from this Alborada. Let's check too the Danza Prima. We can see that Korsakov used the same melody, the same accompaniments, and the same harmonies. It's quite clear, too, that Rimsky Korsakov got his inspiration from this Danza Prima, which would later become the second movement in Capriccio Español, the Variazioni. The same with Canto Gitano, the only non-Asturian movement in Capricho Español, which can be found in the chapter devoted to the music of Andalucía. Again, we can see that Rimsky Korsakov found his inspiration in Castellanos' book. And finally, here we have the Fandango Asturiano. It is quite obvious where Rimsky Korsakov got his inspiration from, isn't it? 
that Rimsky Korsakov literally copied all the music in Capricho Español from Echos de España is a very well known fact here in Spain, especially in Asturias, where all these dances and songs are still very popular as they belong to the people. It is not a very well known fact in the rest of the world, but now you know. This does not mean, obviously, that Capriccio does not feature a fantastic or orchestration. This does not mean that Capriccio is not a masterpiece, which it is indeed. But I think it's quite interesting to know the true origin of this piece and where it comes from. How and when did Rimsky Korsakov get a copy of Echos de España? We really don't know. This issue is still surrounded by myth and mystery. Despite all of the historical and musicological efforts, nothing has yet been proved about how did he get a copy of the book. Anyway, I as an Asturian who knows this music and knows how to play it, I will try to show you the instruments used at that time, the techniques involved, um, how to incorporate everything into a contemporary orchestral context. Let's start then with the alborada. Alborada means dawn, the time of the day when the sun rises above the horizon. By extension, it is also the music played at that precise time. We have then two opposite terms. One is a serenata, a serenade, which is the music played during the evening or during the night, and we have an alborada, which is the music played at dawn. Here in Asturias, alboradas are played in the very early hours of the morning to enunciate the holiday, normally the festivity of the patron saint of the town. A duo compromising a drummer and a bagpiper walks around the town playing happy and festive music, awaking people and announcing the holiday. This, believe it or not, is still done nowadays. I recorded this video in the small town where my grandparents were born. Fantastic, isn't it? So, an alborada is not a specific song, it is a whole genre, like the serenata is. This specific alborada, which was compiled by José Inceña Castellanos and was copied by Rimsky Gorsakov, is known among Asturian bagpipers as the Alborada de Baldomero, Baldomero's Alborada. The first alborada in Capricho Español is a score for timpani, bass drum, cymbals, tambourine and triangle. And this is how the traditional alborada tambourine pattern sounds like. I strongly believe that we should incorporate this kind of traditional techniques into orchestral playing. I think they are much more natural, interesting, musical and, of course, authentic. I have seen many players do this kind of stuff, which is totally alien to traditional technique. And in my humble opinion, that only hides the fact that those players do not know the proper tambourine technique. We could give a tambourine to any other player, a pianist, a violin player, a singer, and that musician would be able to do that. But we are percussionists and we should, we should know our stuff. If we could play things like this, or like this, Our music-making possibilities and capabilities would become almost endless. Why? Because we would have so many different sounds, timbres, characters, articulations, phrasings. Think of it in terms of a string player. A violinist is not a one-trick pony that always plays down bow. String players have a plethora of different bow strokes. Just 
try to be like a string player and try to get from your instrument as many bow strokes as a string players treasure. Traditional techniques have been there for millennia and they have proved their value. So I think we should take advantage of that knowledge and incorporate that into our orchestral playing so we are more musical. I like using the traditional technique I showed you before for playing the alborada. I put my right hand like this so I can hit the head with my middle finger and with my thumb. I set it to a horizontal disposition and use a rocking motion like the one you're seeing. I also hold my tambourine vertically and move it from side to side. I think of a vertical axis that serves as the pivot line for that motion. So when I hit the front of the tambourine, I'm using my middle finger and when I'm hitting the back, I'm using my thumb. I can obviously play on whatever sound on the head of the tambourine I want. That will depend on the sound, character and articulation I want. In this case, I'm playing a little bit on the center so as to get a more drummy sound. That way the articulation is more clear. So the jingles then are providing the brilliance and the noise specifically requested by Runescape Corsica. That way I get a full whole sound from the instrument. It sounds as a unit. I'm not getting sounds from a specific or particular components only. In this case, in, in this home alone context, I'm using this beryllium copper grover tambourine because it's very light, crisp, clear and articulate. Here you have a couple of phrasing examples. Let's check how this first passage sounds together with the percussion section of the Asturias Symphony Orchestra. In this particular context, I have chosen a silver bronze combination Grover tambourine as it allows me a fuller sound and to project more into the hall. This is the second passage in the Alborada. First, I play it by my own and then together with the percussion section of the Asturia Symphony Orchestra. Why do I play it like this? First, because I think the visual aspect is fantastic. Second, because I can get a very swinging rhythm just twisting the tambourine. Third, because I can get many different sounds and characters. Fourth, because I can involve the whole tambourine and get a full sound of the instrument, not single parts, but just the full instrument. Five, because I can get the character indicated by Rimsky Korsakov. The tempo indication says vivo e strepitoso. Vivo means obviously very fast. Strepitoso is not a tempo indication but a character one. Strepitoso means noisy, with great noise. 
when I hold the tambourine vertically, jingles are free to sound and to ring so I can get a fuller sound and that contributes to the noisy character specifically requested by Rimsky Korsakov. Six, because I think those different sounds, characters, articulations add to a very swingy character mood that reminds me the character of the ghost notes when you're playing a nice shuffle is that kind of thing that you can feel you cannot almost hear but it's there and it's creating a feeling something that is there that is creating interest seven because we honor tradition and because we as percussionists demonstrate that we know our stuff and that we are capable of making music in as many ways as possible eight because it is great fun the second movement is touched for the whole percussion section. However, I think it is worth mentioning the origin of this dance. It is titled Danza Prima in Echos de España, but Rimsky Korsakov retitled it as Variazioni. Danza Prima literally means the first dance, referring to the oldest dance known to the Asturian people. This video is a perfect example of a Danza Prima. Do check the feet of the dancers, as they set the perfect tempo for this movement. The second alborada is basically the same as the first one, La Alborada de Valdomero, but this one is one semitone higher and presents slight changes in the orchestration. This second alborada is a score for timpani, bass drum, cymbals, snare drum instead of tambourine, and triangle. This is what an Asturian drum looks like. In fact, Asturian drums have looked like that for centuries, and they still do, because they are being played nowadays. You just have to check the alborada video I showed you before. These drums are around 14 inches in diameter, and their depth can vary between 8 and 10 inches. Should you want your alborada to sound authentic, you may use a deep drum fitted with natural skin heads. Ideally, you would use gut snares or wound silk ones. Please, please, please do not think that I want you to be a purist or that I want you to take the historically informed capriccio route. No, we don't want a hip capriccio, nor we don't want a bird and sandals capriccio, do we? What I'm doing with this video is trying to give you as much information as possible regarding the traditions around in this music, so all your decisions are musical and informed. The role of the drum here is to accompany a melody. As you already know, this traditional music is played by a duo compromising a bagpiper and a drummer. Surprisingly, I find many similarities between this Asturian ensemble and the ensemble formed by a fifer and a drummer you know so well. Just yes, think for a moment in the downfall of Paris, for instance. The drum almost always doubles the melody, sometimes embellishing it. I think that's a style that fits very well into Alborada, which is just a drummer accompanying a traditional melody. A very interesting thing about the Asturian drumming tradition is that green shots are used with profusion. They are omnipresent, they are used all the time to cover the phrasing of accompaniment. Knowing this, you may want to add some green shots, especially if you are using wooden counter hoops, or not. Maybe in the brr kaka brr kaka brr kaka. It's up to you, it's another option in your palette so you can enrich your phrasing, use it or not. I don't think I can say anything about this drum part that hasn't already been said. Just remember that this is a simple accompaniment to a popular melody. Make the drum sound beautiful make music and everything will be fine. Let's then listen to the percussion section of the Asturias Symphony Orchestra play the second alborada.
Escena y Canto Gitano is the following movement. As we already know, it is the only non-Astunian music in Capriccio. We can find it in the chapter devoted to the music of Andalucía in Ecos de España. Andalucía is a region in southern Spain. Asturias and Andalucía are quite far from each other. They are separated by more than 1,000 kilometers, which in European geographical terms is quite a lot. So, our musical traditions are very different. I think it is important to know this because we should treat the Escena y Canto Gitano in a very different way. It should have a totally different character. Escena begins with the most famous role in the repertoire. Again, I don't think I can say anything about this role that hasn't already been said. We can use, of course, a different drum trying to accentuate that difference in character that I mentioned before. There's one thing I like doing when I have to play this role or any other long role. I like using a five notes grid before my role. So I would go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. That creates a swinging motion between my right and my left hand and hopefully it creates a more organic and fluent role that doesn't sound too robotic. Try it, it may work for you. There's one more thing that I think it's worth mentioning. We normally tend to link dynamic changes with changes in sound. And that is because we like using different sounds on the drum head to facilitate those dynamic changes. The problem is that when we play on different sounds on the drum head, the sound also changes. So when playing or moving from one sound to another, we sound as if we were using an equalizer. We may want that or not. So we should try to the link changes in dynamics and changes in sound. That way, when we are phrasing and moving together with the French horns, those changes in dynamics do not also entail a change in sound as if we were using an equalizer, an equalizer sorry. Be careful and try not to sound different depending on the dynamic you are playing at. We get then to the very famous bit. As you can see, I'm singing those cells, tapering them down a little bit. I like that phrasing. As you can see, the character of the drum here is very different. In the Alborada, we were accompanying a melody, almost doubling it, and the drum here functions as brass strokes that color something completely different. We may say that it's a little bit impressionistic. So use your imagination to create something different and to show that, that complete different character. We get then to the different solos by the flute, by the harp, which are not the purpose of this video, so blah, 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 we'll skip that. We get then to a clocky part that interlocks every instrument, which again, is not the purpose of this video. So with your permission, we are skipping to letter Q, where the tambourine gets into the playing field again. Welcome to letter Q. I hope you are awake and ready to play because the second movement was touched, the third movement was touched, and almost all of the fourth movement was touched too. We are playing some rolls on the tambourine here. We are then playing some interlocking patterns together with the triangle, which conform an emiola, which is a change in the rhythmical feeling. We then have three bars to drop the tambourine and start playing the castanets. Let me show you how I do it, then we'll go back and I'll explain the whole process to you.
So, first things first. As you could see, I'm already holding the castanets in my hands in readiness for the Fandango. You may already know how passionate I am about castanet technique. You just have to check some Facebook groups. I really don't like castanet machines, mounted castanets, castanets on handles. Again, I think anybody can play those devices, but obviously lacking the finesse, subtlety, musicality and a specificness that we as percussionists can contribute with. Also, they only produce, let's name it this way, a kind of continuous down bow stroke, thus resulting in very boring musical expression and insipid phrases. So, I encourage you to learn how to play castanets. Castanets are a popular instrument played by people who are no musicians, who cannot read a single note and who don't practice 8 hours a day for 10 years. These people can play castanets very well in many cases. If they can, we, highly trained and highly specialized musicians, should be able to play them too. I promise it doesn't take more than a few days, let's say, a week or 10 days of constant practice, about one hour, one hour and a half a day, to learn to play the castanets in the way that I'm going to show you. Your musicality will greatly be improved if you learn how to play these instruments. Also, you may get the gig, or you may become more employable, who knows? Playing the castanets the proper way will make you more benefit than harm. I promise you. Flamenco castanet technique is obviously the most developed one. The castanets are held with a thumb and the rest of the fingers are used to strike one of the shells. It is a super versatile, flexible and musical technique because it allows for infinite phrases. I have to admit that it is a little bit hard to master because it's quite complicated, but I'm working on it and I have to admit that I'm improving. Should you are interested in the flamenco technique, I strongly recommend you the books by Emma Maleras. It is a fantastic method and it's very well known and popular in Spain because it has proved its value. But there is another castanet technique that is super versatile, flexible, musical, and it works fantastically well in the orchestral context. And guess what? It comes from Asturias. In this case, the castanets are held, sorry about that, with the middle finger, and that same finger is used to strike the instrument. We can get single strokes by muting the castanets against the palm of the hand after striking them. Or if we let them bounce back, we can get double strokes. This is fantastic and it's super versatile because we can relate to the double stroke roll we use on the snare drum. So any single stroke passage can be very easily played by simply alternated single strokes between the right and the left hand. Or because we can play double strokes, we can get phrases just alternating any kind of combinations of singles and doubles thus enriching our phrasing. And the role, unlike the flamenco one, which is done by alternating singles, we can get it with the Asturian, with the Asturian technique, alternating double strokes between both hands. So, this technique is perfect for the orchestral setting. You have no excuse because this technique 
is relatively easy to master to master sorry spend constant time with the instrument and i promise that in no time you will be playing like i was doing in the video i showed you before and once you learn how to do this you will never forget it it's like riding a bike let's go back then to the transition between the canto gitano and the fandango so i can explain you in detail what i am doing stop see that i am already holding the castanets with my middle finger this allows me to play using the traditional asturian technique that i showed you before it also frees my thumb so i can finger roll on my tambourine see also that i'm holding the tambourine using the traditional technique it is in a vertical position and that allows the jingles to ring freely thus getting a fuller sound in this particular case i'm using a silver bronze combination grover tambourine in order to get a fuller sound let's go on Stop! Why did I hit the tambourine with my wrist? It's quite simple and logical, because I don't want a change in the sound. I could have hit the tambourine on the center of the head with my fist, but that would be a total different sound. I want that last stroke, sound-wise, to be a logical consequence of the previous rolls. That way, I get a homogeneous phrase of seven bars. Let's go on. Stop. See that during those five bars, I changed the position of the tambourine because this time, yes, I do want a change in the sound and the character of the instrument. I put the tambourine in a more horizontal position so I can get a more seco sound. And yes, this time I hit the center of the head with my fist. An emiola is produced at this point between the triangle and the tambourine. We go from a 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 feeling to a 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 that rhythmical feeling has to be very clear so i like thinking that passage in three see that i'm using my right arm to mark and show the emiola we have to lock that passage perfectly with the triangle player let's go on stop we only have three bars to drop the tambourine before the fandango do it quietly and carefully Luckily, we are prepared because we are already holding the castanets in our hands. Let's go on. See? This passage can be very easily played when using traditional techniques. They not only facilitate the execution, but they also sound great. What about the Asturian traditional castanet technique? It's great, isn't it? It allows me to play different patterns, roles, I can play different dynamics, I can also taper down the phrases, which is very musical. I really, really encourage you to learn this technique as you will have one more tool in your arsenal. We finally got to the Fandango. El Fandango is a very popular dance in many regions in Spain, even in Mexico and the Philippines, where it has evolved differently according to local particularities. But the castanets are always a very important feature of this dance. El Fandango was very popular during the Baroque period and composers like Mozart, Gluck, Scarlatti, Boccherini, and Padre Soler composed fandangos. This specific fandango, which was compiled by José Inzenga Castellanos in Ecos de España, 
maybe according to musicologist el fandango de pendueles fandango from pendueles pendueles is a very small town in eastern asturias so i will show you how i play the different passages on the castanets in this fandango this is 12 bars before letter t be careful because it's a very exposed solo it's piano and you are accompanying a solo played by your concert master. Scary, isn't it? I like doing a crescendo in the last four bars so as to match the rest of the orchestra. This is six bars before letter U. It is not as exposed as the previous passage because we are being joined by the piccolo, the oboe and the harp, but it is still piano. Again, I like doing a small crescendo in the last two bars so as to match the rest of the orchestra. And finally, this is letter V to the end which is quite a challenging passage for the castanet. Pay attention at letter Z because I will be hitting the two pairs of castanets, one against each other. That is a traditional technique named postifeo. I'm doing that trying to imitate the long crash of the cymbals. I'm also using my arms trying to visually compensate the lack of sustain of the castanets. I'm also doing the postifeo in the penultimate bar. The orchestra finishes with one octave lip, playing the posiceo and getting a very high pitch sound. Then playing conventionally, I get a normal sound, so I get two different pitches, high and low. With that, I'm trying to imitate what the orchestra is melodically doing. This was my Asturian deconstruction of the Capricho Español. I hope you enjoyed it and I also hope that this video encourages you to try all the traditional techniques. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to thank Peter Cates for inviting me. You are terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Asturias Symphony for its help and for all these years. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rafa, and thank you very much, Paco. I would like also to thank Sofia. She always makes the impossible possible. I love you. And thank you very much to all of you who are watching this video. You are very, very, very welcome to Asturias. Consider Asturias your home. Thank you very much for watching. Muchísimas gracias por ver este video y hasta pronto.